tend to uh, like to make sure these things start on time. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm presenting a, a bunch of information. We've been trying to get the computers to cooperate and they've been a little cranky this morning. But um, I, I'm going to do, it's about an hour presentation. It's actually shortened just a little bit from that. Uh, um, I've given this talk for close to five years now and I revise it periodically as new information comes up. So you're getting a new, hopefully improved version of this talk. Um, my little remote thing that changes the slides doesn't work, so I've got my lovely assistant down there helping uh, move the slides for me, so that won't. Um, but if you'll hold your questions till the end, I'm happy to answer questions, and, and uh, typically when I give this, I spend as much time answering questions as I did giving my talk, but um, I titled this talk, well, with the, the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency, but I really subtitle it as Help from the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project, the whole goal of the project was to find genetic problems that we could then identify why they were causing the problems and come up with a treatment that treated it at the cause rather than just treating the symptoms down the road. This is the first and so far the only one of the genetic defects from the Human Genome Project that has an FDA reviewed treatment for it. So this is not a complete answer for everything. The human Genome is very large, and we're going to have a lot more answers down the road, but if they were going to pick one to start with, this is a darn good one to pick from because it affects so many things and affects so many people. Excellent. So I'm not selling anything. This isn't a... I, was talking to somebody about it, and they says, well, is this like a multi-level marketing? Where do I sign up? <laughs> it's not that, okay? And, and then I have to give a legal disclaimer. I'm not prescribing anything so that the lawyers don't come after me. Um, but what I want to do is give you some information that will help you, hopefully, in your situation. Is it going to work for everybody? I guarantee it won't because there are so many things, but a lot of the chronic, ill-defined, difficult-to-treat problems are associated with this gene defect. Now, when I started, and there's a test on this thing. No. When I started, I actually, my son got really sick after he was doing missionary work in Chile. And I had this poster on my wall, and we went through this. Uh, he was studying biochemistry, but he could only function on about 15 minutes a day. And we poured over that poster to try and figure out what to do. And we're talking about one reaction right here. <laughs> I know that you don't have to remember that. Next slide. But what I want to point out is that this is a very, very complex problem. And my son thinks I simplify it too much. I have others that think I don't simplify it enough. So I'm probably relatively close. So the goal here is to give you some practical things that you can get that, quite honestly, you don't even have to have a prescription to do what I'm talking about. Uh, although sometimes the prescriptions are the cheapest way to do some of it. But this is something that um, for a lot of people will really make a big difference. When they first discovered this gene, it was in 1995. But they only discovered one of the two real common genes, which was the 677. So when you look at studies, research studies, you'll see that um, a lot of those studies are based off of the 677. Well, the worst problem 
is if you have a 677 and a 1298. So they were missing the, mo the people with the worst symptoms from this gene defect. So 2001, they discovered MTHFR. In 2005, they actually compiled the research into this book called MTHFR Polymorphisms and Disease. Now, technically, uh, well, politically correct terminology is not defect because that's bad, right? It's actually a uh, polymorphism. It's just different. But if it causes me trouble, it's a defect. So, just to let you know, I'm using a politically incorrect term, and I know it, and I don't care. <laughs> but the reality is, is that these aren't the only ones out there. There's actually now close to 50 that have been identified. These are considered the mild defects in MTHFR. What are the severe ones? Those kids don't last past a year. Many of them die from stillbirth, miscarriage, or uh, are very ill and die within the first year of life. So, but when you get these, uh, if you do the test and get this gene defect back, that's not the complete answer, and I absolutely know that. I've got both genes defective on the MTHFR. The next step in the pathway is methionine synthase. I have both genes defective on methionine synthase. The next step in the pathway is methionine synthase reductase. I have both genes defective on that one too. So we, what I'd really like, my ideal, would be a test that would test all of this pathway so that I could identify every blockage in this, or partial blockage in this pathway. Now it's not a complete blockage or you wouldn't live, but a partial blockage causes a lot of disease processes. Next. And what we're talking about here is that um, this is folic acid. Folic acid is very common. It's in all your vitamins. Every vitamin, multivitamin has folic acid in it pretty much. But the folic acid you get both in your diet and in the, um, the vitamins are folic acids that are um, inactive. They're not ready for your body to use. So this one is the one you get in your vitamin pill. This is what's in your diet for the most part. <coughs> if it doesn't get to here, it's as if you do not have it. Now, you can go to the health food store and actually get this one called uh, folinic acid. That, and it says it's a more active form. True. But the blockage we're talking about is here. Well, what happens if you have both genes defective? If you've got the, either two of the 1298 or two of the 677, this process from here to here functions on about 10% of normal. 10 to 30% depending on which study you're looking at. But the ones within the body, uh, they figure about 10%. So if you're functioning on 10% of normal and your requirements for whatever reason, puberty, illness, whatever reason, go up, you can't compensate. Well, the other thing we've found is there are certain environmental things that affect the same pathway. So what we're talking about is not a lack of folic acid. If you go test these people, their folic acid levels are fine because it's measuring the top two. Actually, it's measuring all of them together. But it's not telling us how much you're getting into the active form. Well, why is that important? Next slide. Well, first of all, if you can't activate folic acid, then you can't do things like make the things that let your nerves talk to each other. So when you don't make serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, you get things like depression, anxiety, irritable bowel, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and migraines. The 
primary psychiatry a number of years ago came out and said those are all the same genetic disorder. They just are different manifestations of that. So what we have is an FDA approved or reviewed treatment. And the difference between approval and reviewed is where it's a natural substance, it's not a compound that they made, so it's a, a review. They FDA review it and then it's released. It's reviewed for things like depression, anxiety, memory loss, um, nerve healing and wound healing in diabetics, and also a whole litany of uh, problems associated with pregnancy. So that's what they studied and got the studies to get it through the FDA. There's another group of things that are also associated with the same pathway. And what those are, are things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel, migraines, uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, and some of the autism spectrum, the ADD, ADHD, and also um, birth defects. Those all have been associated with this pathway. And so it, it really is something that if we can identify people that are struggling in this area and supplement past it, then we can help improve their life. Um, is it going to solve all their problems? No. I can guarantee you it's not going to solve every problem you have. Uh, it won't solve your 18-year-old teenager problem. <laughs> not, not that any of you would have any of that, but okay. Next. So who has this? Well, about a third of the population has both genes defective. Another 40% has one gene defective of the two common ones. But interestingly enough, some of the environmental things cause the same issue. One of the most noted ones is BPA. What's BPA? The plastic stuff. They tell you not to microwave in plastic because it's bad for you. Drop stuff into your food. Well, why is it bad for you? Blocks the same pathway. So if you've got both genes defective and you get the environmental toxicity on top of that, which is one of the models they think is associated with fibromyalgia, you then have uh, gotten into real trouble and potentially get very, very ill. So, but if you look at who would benefit, that's a pretty good share of the population in the United States. The country that has the highest incidence of this gene defect is Italy. And then the lowest incidence is Sub-Saharan Africa. And I have my theories, but anyway, we won't go into my fantasies. 